here. You are listening to the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour, the place to be to learn about the latest and greatest life stories from people who are doing incredible disability advocacy work. Lucy Jones, welcome to the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So let me read a brief bio about you. Uh, so today we have the extreme honor to welcome Lucy Jones onto the Trips and Global on Wheels podcast hour. She is the founder and CEO of Fora. She worked as a social innovator at Eileen Fisher in collaboration with CFDA, Council of Fashion Designers of America, and studied fashion design at Parsons School of Design winning the prestigious uh, Women's Wear Designer of the Year Award in 2015. She has since earned se several accolades, including the Curing Empowering Imagination Award and was, named, and was named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list in 2016. Lucy has exhibited work in the Museum of Art and Design and the Museum of Modern Art. MoMA, where her Cedia Pantyhose work was recently uh, acquired into the permanent collection. So Fora was recently recognized um, by CFDA. Wow, so many awards. Yeah, you're making me sound amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so currently, Lucy is the founder of Fora, which is what we will be talking about a lot. So Fora is a new fashion uh, lifestyle brand dedicated to designing for people who have disabilities. So welcome again, Lucy. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. I feel very honored to be on the show. Thank you. So um, uh, before we go into Fora and talk about, you know, all the, all the, all of your products and uh, the process that went, that mm -hmm. went through, um, tell us about you, who is Lucy? So what is not out there in the media already that you would like people to know about you? I honestly, um, I'm a workaholic. I joke that I have no real hobby anymore apart from, well, work is my hobby because <laughs> I, I love what I do so much and I love designing. I love hearing people's stories. I love talking to people like yourself. Like I genuinely feel like I have the greatest job. I, it's, it's definitely challenging, but I feel that I pour my whole life and energy into my work and it is my true hobby. But I also just, you know, besides that, besides, designing and researching and listening, I feel like I am obsessed with cat videos on YouTube and I can, I can, and when I'm procrastinating, I can easily waste away hours watching cat videos online. And that's my, my secret passion and, and other hobby in life. Yeah. So that doesn't sound marvelous at all, but that's pretty, pretty much what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, you gotta find some way to relax, right? <laughs> Definitely. So, um, I want to know what has always been your dream when, when you were growing up? You know, many of us don't have that, and perhaps you don't either. Um, but if you did, what was your dream when you were growing mm -hmm. up? And how has uh, starting FORA and working with people with disabilities um, how has that helped you achieve your dream in some way, shape, or form? Yeah. Wow. That's an amazing question. Um, I think, so when I was little, I was very expressive. Um, I would, you know, from the age of seven, I was cutting up my own clothes and piecing together, like styling, but I did not think of it as styling or fashion. I, it was just all self-expression and identity. You know, the, the wonderful thing about fashion is you, you get to, you get to try different personas through clothing and um, by you know wearing a certain outfit, you convey a different message. So when I was younger, I, 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 I used to you know wear different scarves on my head or I would wear different w wigs. I got a wig for every birthday because I like loved hair. And I was, I was always just you know playing around with, with my appearance from a very, very young age. And um, I remember in school getting like a little bit teased in a, in a 
in a jokey kind of way by my peers because they were just like what on earth is she gonna wear today and eventually I sort of like toned it down because I (laughs) moved to New York and Mm -hmm. but from a young age I've always been into creativity the arts I studied theater and I and I loved stage and um, acting and just you know telling stories basically it was all about stories from and I I did not think it could be a career um, and storytelling and I think you know I was longing to move from Wales which is where I'm from to come to New York because it's where I'm from it's such a small city Um, I felt like fashion was this distant you know, glamorous world that I just wasn't part of. And I felt like I really wanted to be part of that, like discover who I was, you know? So I moved to to New York City. And when I moved here, I just felt that, and New York City's where I am right now, I just felt that everyone had the same dream. So then I was like, oh, (laughs) um, I guess this is it. This must be what fashion is. And, And I was a bit disheartened by it all. I just felt it was a bit... You know it wasn't my personality so I started working with and um, with people with disabilities I felt that if I wanted to do something in fashion I had to make it count and I wanted to do something that I just just would be excited to wake up doing every day and I just felt like churning out the same design wasn't going to cut it for me so it was a, a, a younger family member who challenged me to think about he has cerebral palsy and or cerebral, as it's pronounced in the States, um, uh, cerebral palsy. And he challenged me to really consider the accessibility of whatever I was designing and to consider people with disabilities into the design process from the very get-go before concept. And that was just this, the, the challenge was just like, you know, very much welcomed, something I'd never considered before. And that's when I just started talking about it in the classroom saying, you know, we only have this standing mannequin and it doesn't even represent the most of society. And just having these moments of like, oh, wow, I think we're not even serving like basically anyone, like who are we even designing for these days? And so after that, it just enlightened my whole like design journey working again I'm a storyteller a curator I never want to take someone's voice away and I think that having different diverse people coming into the room hearing their stories and trying to build something with someone um is has changed the way I think about design in the world and the way I see the world as well that was a very long answer but hopefully you got something out of that yeah wow wow yeah I know there are a lot of artists and designers in New York i I did my master's in London and I lived in New York prior to that for two years. So I um, can definitely relate to what you were saying. And, and we're so, I'm personally so happy that you've gone into the accessible design, um, universal design world in the lens of fashion and design. Um, Thank you. As, as you were saying, and as your exposure has informed you, people with disabilities want things that are beautiful, that are aesthetically pleasing and you know and not just a big bulky clunky you know wheelchair or whatever uh tool that may be and be able to really personalize and accessorize it that's it speaking of skills and expertise how have you been able to find people to offset your own skill sets mm-hmm. and you know tease and creating these line of wheelchair accessories because um as i've read it it wasn't necessarily your core skill set these kind of products that you have you have come out launched in July right yeah so how have you been able to overcome that hurdle yeah oh wow wonderful and thank you for asking that question because you know a lot of press and a lot of PR want to focus on kind of like one person if that makes sense Mm -hmm. and for me and what we do with the company is it's not about one person but it's about like kind of like a movement it's really about a long-term vision and we want to kind of like you know set the foundation for Um, and I'm really glad you asked that question because I absolutely have so many weaknesses I have strengths but where my weaknesses are and also I don't I'm not personally disabled I do not have a disability and so you know who am I really to tell people how they should you know like um wear things or use things there is absolutely you know the knowledge that i do not have so i think you know number one is making sure that you have um voices and differentiating voices 
who are people who have disabilities and again varying disabilities so w one person's experience is not the same as someone else's making sure you have that you know from the get-go the other thing is making sure and you know my background is in fashion and apparel um, but of course the since we specifically are looking at the wheelchair it's a very robust um, design and something that takes a beating daily from you know all the elements whether it's you know rain or, or whether it's curb cuts not being present and this takes a lot of you know friction and of course soft goods and apparel aren't going to cut it they'll just fall apart or they break and we know things have to be hard wearing and that is not my skill uh, my skill is you know in uh, aesthetics and and kind of um you know what makes things fashionable and the soft goods which is also crucial in the process exactly um and i think you know a combination of marrying my skill set and bringing on Jonas Kayostila, who um, is the head of industrial design, who I design alongside, who is honestly a champion. He um, came in at the early days and he constantly challenges me and we have those creative arguments along the way. But again, we also, I think what's really important about the company is we don't get married to any one thing. We are as quick to fall in love with something as we are to throw it out the window if we think it doesn't work. And I think just not getting married to something and having people and not being so, you know, uptight about our designs, you know, when someone says, hey, this is not going to work for me and not try to like force it and make it work, but accept that, all right, we missed the mark, we got it wrong. And having that like permission to fail and fail and fail is like the most important like trait of the company, I think. And so, you know, bringing people in, into the room who are very diverse, who have different backgrounds, different skill set there is only one way it's going to work and it's that way. <laughs> so, um, and we're still figuring it out as well. I don't think we have all the answers. I think we definitely miss the mark sometimes, but um, at least we have, we have checkpoints and we, we make sure that we, if we're going to do something, we're going to make sure that it's vetted. Um, and, and it's also, you know, in collaboration. So. Yeah. I think that's one thing you know, failure, what we've read over and over from successful people um, is that you have to be willing to fail so many times. Oh, yeah. Um, those trial and errors are so important. And it's not necessarily yeah. an, an, an easy process. Sometimes people all get lucky. But for the most part, we, you know, try different things and fail a million times. So my next question is, what are, are some of your uh, takeaways from your exposure to the disability community since entering Parsons School of Design? Because as I understand it, you didn't really have that much exposure up until you came to the U.S. and, you know, entered Parsons. Yeah, totally. I think that my eyes were opened by just this frustration that um, I felt that when you move to New York coming from a place that is and then coming to a place that is so rich culturally rich and realizing that I know nothing I'm a baby you know like I, I have no knowledge really and uh, and just being cool with that and refreshing myself and almost like checking myself I think that the eyes, eyes being opened and making sure you're like a sponge and taking it all in and asking questions and learning and having that curiosity um, is basically the what you need when you you know you can't generalize someone and you can't expect to know about someone's life. So when you're working with people with disabilities, I think you know um, one thing that is the best joy about what we do is uh, everyone has their own way of using things and. Um, creating their own system in a way that is so ingenious and so creative. And honestly, it is motivational and inspiring because, and I hate to say, you know, you know, the word inspiring, but it is inspiring. But when we designed the product, we designed with, you know, alongside a bunch of people that were using it in a specific way. And then of course we'll hand the product to someone else and they'll use it in a way that we never anticipated. And we were just like, Oh my God, like that is, that's so cool. And so we are constantly getting taught. And I think that, you know, making sure that like 
you know you don't have all the answers and I, I keep going back to this but making sure that you constantly are learning and and developing and improving it was the biggest takeaway that like you have to remember that you don't know everything and you have to be open to that constant learning um and then the other thing that I will say about you know I, I went to into a school that had like a privileged education. Like the tuition is very high there. And I was very lucky to, you know, have had a grandfather who wanted to support my journey. You know, financially it was a, a struggle to, to get here. Um, but then realizing that so many people don't have access to that education and don't have access to the resources. So how can I use this platform and what I've been given um, to, to promote this and to, to bring it to that, you know, stage, but again, <laughs> not, not be the front runner or the hero or anything like that, but you know, how can I just help uh, or be a part of a conversation rather? And I think that that is the biggest learning as well is, you know, remembering the, the power that you have and the platform that you have and how you have to use it um, and what influence you have and be responsible for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm very much empowered by you right now. I'm so oh. feeling so grateful that you are come on my oh. show and I'm getting to talk to you because you're so community oriented and you just are so aware of the fact that, you know, with, with achieving a mission such as yours, you need so many people and it's yeah. not just one person despite how much the media wants to just have a, a spokesperson out there it is yeah. and honestly it keeps me up at night like when i started the company about two years ago i had a fear that that um oh just i wanted to be invisible you know behind the scenes i had this fear of uh I don't want to be a person that takes away a voice, but I want to be part of it. Like I want to be a movement. This is the reason why it's not called Lucy Jones show, you know, <laughs> like, it's called Fora. Um, and it stands for the word forum, which is a place where your voice is heard. And I think that this like, you know, community is, is, and, and also businesses, if they're not community oriented, then they might as well not be in business because I just think that's what the world needs and it needs to have support. And I'm not trying to be like all, you know, altruistic and like world peace or anything, but I genuinely think it is much better when people work together and, and, you know, are open-minded. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm glad you said that. And it, I was very touched. So thank you. Yeah, of course. You actually answered my next question, oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> which was, what, how did you come up with the name Fora? Yeah, that was it. Um, um, the name, again, of course, um, I needed it to stand for something. I needed it to represent something. And I think it was, I can't remember who now, which is a bit of terrible, but someone said, the early, I remember thinking about the disability community is very resourceful and quite used to problem solving and hacking their surroundings and, you know, just, you know, learning from one another. And a lot of it are on forums where people are giving tips and DIY tips for like a bag or like, you know, how to, you know, you know, fix a wheel on their chair and things like that. And I just saw that forum as like being this really wonderful space and exchange of dialogue and ideas but then in the in all the focus groups we've had in the very early stages people just kept saying like oh I love when you do these I feel like we, we can just offload and get it out there and it just felt like it was an exchange of ideas and dialogue and yeah the word uh, fora is latin or plural sorry for the word forum mm -hmm. uh, yeah that's really what it means and a lot of people don't even know that so there we go yeah, no i didn't know that yeah i'm new so how many people are on your team currently and yeah. how do you keep things constantly moving forward because the last i read you only had two people on your team but has it grown since my goodness we are still two people full time and i work around the clock I but again a labor of love um, it is hard because we are obviously responding we, we have you know contractors so there are people and we obviously have a wonderful group of people who task with us and work with us I think the goal is to make sure that the company our, our model can be proven you know I hope it becomes successful because our goal is to create opportunity and have a workforce that is way bigger than two people and honestly because I would like to go to bed at a reasonable hour as well 
But um, no, we're two people full time, which is me and Jonas, but we have engineers in Boston. We have people who come in and work with us, um, you know, who sit in our product meetings, who test our products, you know, we have, and the idea is we'd love to bring people on full time. Obviously we have like customer service and uh, we have, but that's all part time. And we, you know, we have the little things that make the business really operational, but of course the idea is to make sure that we can prove our business model hopefully become <laughs> financially stable and of course increase our our team which would be wonderful wow that's impressive um so i'll share with you that i actually i have my own startup i created it about a year ago and so i understand the challenges of that oh yeah pushing it forward being one one person and I'm glad you have two people that's you know double the manpower oh my goodness I feel for you yeah well I was one person for about uh, a year before I brought Jonas on and um, I think that like anyone who meets another person who's been part of a startup knows the struggle <laughs> that just it is so like and I think you know um, I, I, I wish kind of people did know just how like kind of scary it is to to start a company um and you know follow all the procedures and make sure everything's in check and then learn it all on the go but um i also joke and i also will say this again and again um it is not possible without good mentorship good advisors having a strong support network having a shoulder to cry on and having people to like celebrate with you when you've got like a mini win or like something feels good. So you've got to just have that balance and try to just maintain the, uh, the journey at a middle rather than constantly getting like excited and then having the really big lows as well. So you've just got to like stay in the middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is hard. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you said, um, having a community having a support system around you that is so crucial totally um so and i think for many startups and we've covered it a little bit um funding is a big hurdle so how did you fund your company in the beginning and make sure it continues to grow to this point moving forward yeah thank you for saying that funding is just the bane of the existence it's it's so hard. It really is. And I'm, and honestly, um, and I talk about this a lot. Um, there's not that many women in tech because obviously I'm actually investment backed. The company rather, sorry, is investment backed. So we were able to attract investors, but to even present a, the, the opportunity and to talk about it in, in, you know, in that way as a biz, a viable business. Um, when you, when you, map out demographics there's a lot of misalignment with the way investors think and the way the, uh, some of them not all of them because obviously i would say we had a lot of wonderful ones <laughs> but some of them just would say oh this is you know this demographic is too small and you're just mind blown just like what are you talking about like one in seven people and it's just that that misunderstanding and so i felt i i've I, the investment process was you know challenging there is no there's no easy way to to raise money um but we have been able to be very lean very careful with the money um and invest it wisely into into how we're spending it um hence why we are still just such a small team as well uh but hopefully again things will change and we're starting to see the excitement we're starting to see the growth um so it's a uh, onwards and upwards from here I think and moving on to more into the startup now so how do you continue to discover the need for your product mm -hmm. how are you getting enough clients to you know to not be in debt and keep growing and in other words what methods are you using to reach yeah. the target market yeah I think we've planned out um you know it's called runway isn't it we've planned out um, going into this, I made sure that we had enough money to test the concept. So we have like, you know, X amount of time to really prove a business model and apply it with history data metrics. But in terms of like, you know, have we got enough customers or consumers, like since we launched, which was only a month ago, um, 
it's been phenomenal. And in terms of keeping things fresh, I think we thought the business model was one thing, but you never really know until you put it out into the world and you let customers tell you what your business is and you've got to be ready and nimble and make sure you're responding to that. And I, so I think we, we put the business out into the world. You know, it was very specific, even though we have big visions to expand our product line, but we had to start somewhere. So we launched the company and it, it was this, you know, product that was affixed to the lower tubes of manual chairs. And then of course, we saw people putting it on walkers putting it on crutches and basically telling us actually I can put it on other other things that you may ne not necessarily have thought about and of course we had thought about that but we thought it was going to come later <laughs> we thought it was going to come much later on in the business and now we're like oh we have to move now. Like, this is, what the, this is what the people want. So of course, people are emailing us and suggesting things. You know, people are like, oh, I love this, but you know, if you had done this, and we're like, we understand. And so that's what we've been having to do is, um, that's how we keep things fresh, is people are just telling us like what they want to see. And, you know, have we considered this? And it would be great if we could do that. And I think that's how we keep things moving and fresh. And there is no shortage of ideas. I'm going to explode with the idea, <laughs> with ideas. And I'm like, keep them. There's too many. <laughs> like, I don't want to hear anymore. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's just, there, there's just, there's no shortage of things to do. So um, there is no loss of momentum ever. In fact, I wish we could slow down a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, there are so many things that could be improved, right? There's so many gaps, especially, you know, um, with the vast number of individuals with disabilities and each disability with their own unique needs. And so it is quite, um, there's quite a lot out there. Yeah. So I want to move on to your products. Um, so they range from $25 to $138, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So while, while the full set of essentials, you were saying the full set costs about $157. So my question is, yeah. um, and I see that some of your bag collection, um, many of them are over $100. Yeah. Um, the question is, given that only around 30% of people with disabilities are employed in the U.S., how are you able to reach target audiences yeah. and make sure these products are affordable to them? Yeah. So I'm really glad you brought that up. This has been something that we have talked about for about two years, pricing something, especially when you feel like no one has ever done something before. The tricky thing about when you launch a new concept is pricing like how the heck do we price this we basically priced our since we so the way it works we're such a small company that we don't have the infrastructure to put like, basically lower our costs with the factories yet we're not at the scale or the stage and i believe that is genuinely why um i think what we did was we basically got the product as low as we possibly could and but we also wanted to use materials that were quality and we also wanted to use factories that were fair you know and so I think that when you put all that recipe together you end up with these price points however that being said oh and just another thing is um people we're working on ways right now to figure out cost sharing. We have many ideas because we know these concerns um, and it's something we're very passionate about. Like what's the point in being a company that promotes accessibility if we're not, you know, seen as being accessibly priced? So we, we obviously know this and we're working on ways of like cost sharing or splitting and things and initiatives to be able to reduce costs or figure out ways in the future. Obviously we can't do that right now, but making sure we can implement, the, implement them. So as we grow and as a customer base, like right now we've obviously got an audience that can afford them, but then the idea is, okay, so how do we expand to make sure that those who can't afford can? And so I think we're still learning and we're still hearing and we're still trying to figure out how to do it. And of course, again, people are giving us suggestions like, Oh, you should try this. Or like, have you thought about a firm or quad bay or Klarna? And we're like, Oh yeah, this is, you know, great. And again, we're, we're just open-minded and learning. So I think 
that was a great question. Um, something that we care deeply about and something that we're actually working on. And it's something I dedicate like <laughs> many hours a day to. So, um, yeah, I think we still do have an audience, believe it or not. Uh, but that's not going to be enough for, for us to feel satisfied as a company. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that was already on the radar. Oh my gosh, so on the radar. <laughs> <laughs> I was always on the radar. <laughs> yeah. So my next question is, so a lot of your, the, these first line of accessories is attachment systems. So are tools provided for these attachment systems? Yes. Yes? Okay, yes. so everything you need is in one kit. Yes. Okay. And the other thing, and again, another nod to, to who we get to work with is, um, you know, we work with people who carry Allen wrenches and tools with them so they can tighten up aspects of their uh, wheelchair if it got loose, you know, like a brake or something like that. And, um, and I remember thinking, like, oh, wouldn't it be great to have like, and actually this wasn't, this was Jonas's idea. Um, we were saying originally the tool was going to be part of the design. And then I thought, and after learning and hearing more about how people would transition, you know, out of bed or like, you know, you know, using the, the restroom or something, could that nick someone's leg or could that accidentally hurt someone? And then we were just thinking about, oh, wait, hang on, that would stick out and that's not great. So then eliminating the tool from the design and making it separate. And then we realized it could be a keyring, and that could also work for other elements of the screws on chairs or the screws that you need um, you know, to tighten or anything. So we, we thought that was kind of funny and an overlooked portion of our design, a portion of our design, that people don't know that it comes with a very own, its very own key ring, which is the, t- the screw that it tightens the screw and that that's how you attach it. And also, so you can remove it whenever you want as well, if you carry the key ring. Mm-hmm. And then this question um, is a personal curiosity of mine. What are your tips on working with foreign manufacturers on these very specialized products. Uh, it's very niche and you know, not very many multinational companies go into this. Yeah, honestly, I think at the end of the day, um, uh, that hasn't been a problem um, because they are looking at technical drawings. They're not looking at, um, and I didn't, la- I laugh because we've had, obviously we've had pain moments. We've had moments where things have gone horribly wrong. Like we we're just like, oh God, like so I've never known one startup who hasn't had teething issues and we've had many. Um, because again, we've done something that's never, it's, you know, designed from scratch. So, uh, of course, we have technical drawings, so they're just looking at on the basis of what measurements they need to hear and what's the tolerance. And so um, just communication. We have a Chinese speaking um, person on our team because we work with a factory in China. We have a factory in India and our factory in India who produce our bags. Um, I'm sure he won't mind me saying this, but our factory owner who is phenomenal, I consider him family at this point, but he, his father um, is uh i want to say he's he's deaf or he's hearing impaired and he so he took to the the project on a personal level because he and and was able to work with us on such low quantities and new order because he had a personal like appreciation for you know doing this and so i think like there is it always hits home for someone and i think that um, again, I wish more companies were doing it. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's just about having really good drawings and making sure that the, the technical aspects are, are very much um, considered. Mm-hmm. Looking into the future, what is your biggest and wildest dream for Fora? Oh, oh, I just really want to build a wonderful team. That's like on my mind right now. Um, I really want to you know, be able to have the resources that I can put my money where my mouth is and like really show what, what a a team should look like uh, in a way that I think needs to happen and is missing in society almost. I think there are some companies who are doing a great job, but I'd love to be able to do that. I think I would love to be able to have a number of collaborations that are a mixture of, 
you know, working with the medical, uh, like working with the mobility industry and the medical device industry, but also working and, and, you know, figuring out the tension with mainstream fashion brands, but making sure that, um, you know, they're the right brands and the right collaborations as well. I would love that because I think that would be a way to show those companies also this, this can introduce you to a customer you may not have considered. And I think that would be uh, wonderful if that happened um, and something I'm working on too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and now our very last question. If you could launch for and your line of wheelchair accessories all over again, what would you do differently? What are the biggest lessons you've learned since starting for a, a couple years ago? Um, I don't think I would have, would have done anything differently because I think all the lessons and all the pain and the good stuff has been well worth it. There have been times where I've like been close to just, you know, like giving up because it's just, it is a lonely road. I feel even though there's a massive support system, um, the only thing I would change is my mentality a little bit because I definitely, as I've mentioned, like I am a workaholic and I sometimes I'm not very good at like handing things off to other people. So I definitely would have uh, liked a little bit more or I would have I wish I had more like trust almost to hand things off. So that I'm like definitely working on. Um, but the learnings, I think just a nonstop, we're learning something new every day. So again, that's a thrill and the best part of the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's great. It seems like you've, you've grown, the company has grown a ton and you say you have six lines, six, six different products. things, six products in the making. That's so exciting. And uh, this interview honestly could go on and on because I'm so curious and I have so many more questions. I was, you know, a few hours ago cutting down my questions. And oh. Just cutting down, and cutting down, and cutting down. You probably think this is a lot. But I had a long list. And so, um, but I'll, I'll spare you the, the pain of answering more. But it's been, oh. it's been so much fun interviewing you and just learning and I'm sure, you know, um, our listeners will be really excited as well for those who don't know you of the great work that you're doing. So thank you so much, Lucy. Oh, thank you for having me. I really loved it. And I really also just love that you brought the business side of things into the, into the interview because I don't often get to talk about really the guts of the company. So thank you very much for your thoughtful questions. And I, and I hope uh, people enjoy. Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives, keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on another episode of the Traipsing Global on Wheels podcast hour.